What a crowd. Good to be here, Christian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, how are you doing? Terrific. Uh, it's the first time slush. Okay. Uh, you tried to pull me here for four years, now it's finally there. And uh, as what people say, it's uh, uh, dark, cold and very big. And everybody's here, it's really exciting. Yeah, everybody's here. It's an important thing. Yes. Good. Uh, but do you like it so far? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, uh, it's really good after COVID. Everybody's coming together, the ecosystem, investors, yeah. startups. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Well, great for coming. Thanks for coming here. We should talk about Trade Republic, and I'm, I, I know a lot about the companies that have been, you know, part of, a partner of yours for four years, but talk, talk, to, talk to us a little bit about Trade Republic. What is it really? Sure. So, um, Trade Republic basically um, is a savings platform, meaning we empower people across 17 European countries to invest in capital markets. You can do self-directed investing, or you can set up a savings plan, meaning you subscribe to a monthly installment into a big basket of assets. We do so because we believe that many people, especially young people, want to build up for their own pension, want to save and build wealth, and we help them to do so. We started in 2019 and uh, are now present in all markets, including Finland. Fantastic. So it's a savings platform. You can trade, you can save long-term, right. ETFs. Uh, and now you launched bonds as well, haven't you? Yes, so, I mean, on paper, many people confuse it with Robinhood, right? It looks very similar. You can trade and invest stocks commission-free. Um, but what people don't understand is that the market in Europe is quite different mm. because it was never hard for people in Europe to invest short-term capital markets, to um, do short-term trading. What we do, basically, is we empower people to save recurrently, continuously, and therefore create wealth. And so we hope that over the next 30 years, many people will uh, have a sufficient pension with us. Fantastic. So that's Trade Republic, savings platform leading in Europe. Uh, you're doing fantastic. How, how big are you really today? Well, so the company has grown very, uh, uh, very fast. Um, today we're over 600 employees uh, operating 17 markets. Um, and over the years we've grown to be the largest savings platform in Europe, meaning there's millions of people across those 70 markets um, saving with us. And what's important, 65% of our customers are first time investors meaning people who have never invested before in their lifetime, and they're starting this savings journey with us. And then going back again a little bit before 2019, when I met you, you've been working on it for three or four years. You had, were just about to come out of the blocks. Uh, you had funded the company quite roughly with 75% owned by a, a, a seed investor, and you were trying to raise money. How come you spent four years you know, preparing yourself for launch, and how, how come you were in that situation, and, and what happened? So I think we're a quite unusual startup story. Um, I myself studied philosophy, so I have no freaking clue how I ended up here. Um, and we started the company in 2015 with this vision of building a platform, a bank, which empowers people to save. Now, if you're 25 years of age and you run around saying to investors, I can found a bank with 25, um, everybody thinks you're crazy. So uh, for four years, we had over 200 investor meetings. Uh, we almost never saw the partner, right? We almost never see a, a, a term sheet. So we would need to bootstrap the company. And during that time, we raised multiple angel rounds. So we've been bankrupt almost every quarter and then doing another angel round and angel round and angel round to that point where we uh, sold 65% of the company to an angel investor. And then when we got the banking license and we started to operate, all of a sudden the VCs, they came along and said, okay, maybe now we can talk. So um, back then, then you guys invested, other investors invested, and uh, uh, today, yeah, we raised over 1.3 billion euros um, uh, in funding um, from that early days. But basically, we've seen uh, a lot of the uh, honest and early work uh, of, a, of a small startup. But you spent those four years. Those are, those are really important for you to get the banking license. How comes it takes four years, and what's particular with that, and what? How important were those four years for you for the rest of building the fintech success that you've had today? I mean, I need to be honest. Um, I think back then, we thought it would take a year to get a banking license, maybe 18 months. So if you would have told me it would take uh, four years, I would never do it again, right? That was a horrible time. It was a very long time. But obviously, in hindsight, that was the foundation for our success because by getting the banking license, we developed a very firm and deep understanding about the regulatory environment, about the business model, about things you can and cannot do. And at the same time, we've been able to invest very, very deeply into our infrastructure. So we've built an entire core banking system in-house because we just had no money to uh, uh, buy something else. 
And I think today that what makes Trade Republic maybe unique, that we have an own license, an own banking structure, infrastructure, and so basically fully independent from any partner. That means we can move very, very fast in developing new features. And through that platform, you've been able to sort of launch in 17 euro countries, basically, as well. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we started in Germany for the first 18 months, and then little by little would grow to France, Italy, Spain, and all the remaining markets. And um, then still, you're now developing local products. You want to be tax easy in those countries. It's a very long journey, but with the platform we're having and the licenses, um, it's something you can actually do. And then raising 1.3 billion is not an easy feast. We, we, I think we invested, we had an 8 million round in 2019. Right. Tell us about that story. You, we, we got that done and then that was early 2019 and then COVID came and what happened then? You could either go either way. Yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, it's always important to emphasize we saw the first four years where nobody would touch you. So uh, uh, we had a kind of a good understanding that uh, uh, we need the right investors for long term. And then luckily we got uh, Creandum, we got Project A in the Series A round. Uh, then in 2019, even before COVID, the company was doing it really well um, and we were growing very fast. And um, then in 2020, um, COVID hit and obviously many more people thought about investing and the company would grow even faster. And then slightly before um, COVID really came and the, the pandemic hit and lockdowns happened, we've been able to raise a Series B round led by Excel and Founders Fund. Um, and that was, I think, basically the last business meeting I had before, before the lockdowns. Um, and then during the next two years, the company would again grow uh, quite, quite healthy and quite fast. So we could do a, a Series C round uh, led by Sequoia. And uh, even last summer, we did uh, another extension by Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, uh, one of the largest pension funds on earth, um, um, to now really prepare ourselves for what next. And, and are we allowed to say that you're profitable today? No, as you know, uh, we don't share uh, uh, numbers broadly, but um, <laughs> we're very focused on running a healthy business. I yeah. come from a very rural, boring part of Western Germany, and so I think since day one, we've been uh, incredibly focused on building something which is long-term sustainable. Yeah. So COVID hit, um, and you escaped. I, I don't know what, how many customers you, you got every day at that time. I mean, it really catapulted the company for everybody was trading at home and wanted to launch savings accounts. But how did you manage to manage that with remote work and, uh, and, uh, and getting so many customers on board? So I remember very vividly, um, we've been growing very fast and then so we've been 100,000 customers after the first year of operating. And that was uh, March 2020. And so as a company of 30 people, you then do a small party, you get a cake, and we had these balloons you get like with the 100,000 big silver balloons. And that was on a Friday and then over the weekend, the German government would say there's a lockdown. And then uh, during the next, I think, four or five months, the company would grow from 100,000 customers to 1 million just in four months. So it was incredibly fast growth. And um, yeah, those balloons, the 100,000, they basically stayed in the office and it looked a bit like, you know, Chernobyl, you know, like people just left their desks and went home. And uh, that has been always a reminder about how far we've come uh, in those four, four, four months. Um, but obviously it is, as an entrepreneur, um, a pretty wartime situation because um, you're growing fast, you're hiring people, people are in lockdown. And so you learn a lot about yourself and about the business. But you did, a, I think you, what you did before COVID shut down, you did a simulation, I heard. Wasn't that something you did to, to, to make sure you could work under remote conditions? So I'm blessed with the co-founder, Thomas, who uh, is an incredibly uh, great engineer. Um, and he's always incredibly concerned about the geopolitical situation. So yeah. when COVID hit, I remember he just came to the office with one of those big military grade uh, air masks and that's why I recognized, oh my God, this might be something. And then actually, yes, we did a few simulations uh, back then, uh, just sending the company home for one day and seeing how it worked. And that was very good in hindsight because it prepared us for what would come. You're 600 people today. And when we invested, I think you were 20 or something yes. like that and you scaled marvelously. How can you, as a, as a founder, what were some of the insights and inflection points during growing the team from 20 to 600, scaling during COVID, regulatory environment, success, and you know, millions of users onboarded? Like, what are, were the changes in terms of maybe hiring or style of management that you sort of went through during these years? 
So we've been, yes, 20, 30 employees, and then as a company would grow, we would basically hire a lot of people. So at some point, I think we had 50 or 100 people joining a month, so it was a very fast-growing period. Um, and during that time, obviously, you want to hire senior executives, right? People who have seen that kind of organization already. And I remember, I think, when we had like 40 or 50 people, and we just did the Excel and Founders Fund round, I think we thought to ourselves, we're pretty good already. And then we hired the first executive, came from Netflix, and I remember the first meeting, and uh, I was really blown away because it completely reset the benchmark for me, what great looks like, what good looks like, right? And so then over that time, we would bring in more and more executives. Um, in hindsight, I would describe that time a bit like puberty. As a leader, I think uh, you need to be very vulnerable about the fact that um, if you're growing fast, you do not know which kind of leader you are. You do not know what's your management style. And so, as everybody likely knows from, from themselves, poverty is a very painful phase where you're trying out different things. So I remember one time we would be Amazon and everybody would write memos. Uh, the next time we would be uh, Netflix and a lot of freedom, responsibility, everybody would read that book and uh, maybe someday I was wearing a turtleneck and I felt like Steve Jobs. So um, we did like a lot of those phases and the truth is after three, four years of that, you kind of build your own style and your own character, right? You define what is Trade Republic, what is our culture and then uh, you manage to build an employee brand, you manage to attract talent, which, which is up for that, and then basically really the culture becomes very, very strong, right? And today, the Trade Republic is a very fast-moving, very intense culture in the city of Berlin, and we're very, very proud of the people um, who want to join such a company and then thrive in that uh, environment. Are you Steve Jobs now? I mean, no, no, luckily not. No. Luckily not now. But you're very product-focused as a CEO. Uh, is, is, have you always been that way? Yeah, well, so we believe... Um, What's important as an early company and still is today is build a product which is able to grow virally, right? So the best marketing is the free marketing you get in the lunch table at the family at home, right? So when somebody comes and says, well, I'm using that product, it's so exciting. And so we've been, from the very first day, incredibly focused about creating those moments of happiness, moments of excitement people will talk about. And still, till this very day, we get more than 50% of our customers uh, through word to mouth. Right? So uh, people are really promoting uh, our trade public. So yes, I'd say the entire company, including myself, is incredibly product focused. But I don't believe that's it when you found a fintech, because I think the, the, the reason a fintech exists and is different and is better is its ability to translate regulatory requirements into a great product which feels nice and neat, and at the same time um, has an efficiency in operating and efficiency in, in, in doing technology, so you can do it at scale, right? So I think fintech can only be understood if you have this triangle, like a regulatory requirements, a great loving product, and operational efficiency, and we try to balance these things throughout the years. And what I've noticed from, from the board's perspective, at least I think it is, and I, 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 you should confirm it, you have an extreme performance culture, I think, in your company. People are really delivering and, and uh, and shipping product and, and, and improving the, the experience from the consumer all the time, which is really important for fintech companies, right. especially for consumers. How are you instilling that performance culture? So yeah, as I said, I think you try out different cultures, right? And um, many people preach like uh, this loose management and its flexibility, and that I think works well for, for many companies, and they go incredibly successful with it. We found this not succeeding at Trade Republic, at, at least not at this very stage. So um, we, we, we created a culture where we promise only one thing to our employees, that you do, will do the best work in your career at Trade Republic. So it will not be maybe the happiest place or the most fulfilling place, but it will be the place where you work with the smartest people on the hardest problems. And over the years, we really owned this culture now. So yes, we run an, uh, an, an intense organization where people can get things done quite quickly. So um, we have 14 different elements, product elements, and we do weekly business reviews, like every single team checks in, including myself visiting the meeting. We had a great uh, product leader uh, from Revolut, Marcel, who's basically bringing that culture, promoting it throughout the organization. And that gave us a lot of trust in the organization and the people and helps us to be really uh, nimble and fast in delivering new features. Let's to turn to the regulatory side again. It's like a necessary evil, or how do you look upon, upon that? BaFin is one of the toughest FSA, I mean, reg regulatory authorities in Europe. 
you, you got the banking license early, you continue to have good relationship with them. What's, what has been essential there and, and managing growth during this, these times? Well, I think in hindsight, I'd say, I'd say regulation and, 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 and BaFin, it's like a love-hate relationship. So obviously, as an entrepreneur, you're incredibly impatient. You want to get things done super, super quick. And then regulation always gets in the way and make things muddy and, and slow. And you, you, you kind of don't like it and you sleep very badly sometimes. Um, so that's the hate part. But at the same time, I think you need to recognize the fact that being in the club of being a bank, operating and, and getting the money of people is an incredibly big moat and entry barrier for everybody else. We've seen that many US companies failed to really conquer Europe or go into Europe because they would not really accommodate European regulation, our understanding of how banking business should be built. Yeah. And I believe if you own this and if you build a very, very strong muscle in making regulatory things your entry barrier mode, you can build a very, very valuable company, which is incredibly hard uh, to replicate. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to raise so much money, because we could promise to investors a fast-growing product, yes, but at the same time, true entry barrier, something which is incredibly hard to replicate for others. Mm -hmm. And that is then very enticing for growth investors. So using the regulatory environment as a moat and then building great product on top of that. Well, I think some of our of our late stage investors said this one thing to me, which I keep hearing in my head. It's basically, um, you go from zero to a unicorn to one billion valuation with the permission of the customer. So you need great product market fit, a product consumers love. But you go from one billion to 10 billion with the permission of the politicians, right? So basically, in order to really become a big financial institution to be really relevant, you need to have a great relationship with regulators, build a lot of trust that requires a lot of time, and if they then give you the permission, and we see everywhere fintechs who literally do not get this permission, um, um, it's really a big entry barrier. Speaking about the regulatory environment, your, one of your revenue sources is uh, payment for order flow, which the European Union has banned until 2026, whatever, we'll see how, how that pans out. But what, how, how big of, of your revenue is, is payment for order flow, and how do you look upon that kind of revenue? as? Yes. as yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe to explain. So, um, payment for order flow is a, a business model in brokerage where you get a revenue share from the exchange. So, if you would do a trade, uh, we route it to an exchange, and then the exchange basically gives us something of the money they earn back. Um, that's something which is in the industry for now 30 years, um, and almost every bank, the banks you likely use, uh, is using payment for order flow. Um, but because of the success of new business models like ours, um, there's been a lot of lobbyism against it from incumbents, and so the European Union is right now contemplating um, in, in, in changing uh, uh, the rules and maybe banning it. That might happen in 2026. Um, I mean, I believe it's a really pity for you, a pity for me, a pity for the uh, uh, investors, because um, um, payment for order flow shows that retail trades do have a value. And this value had not been honored for the last 10, 20 years because you were still paying high fees at your brokerage company. And a company, Trade Republic, showed that with payment for order flow, you can basically give it to the people by having commission-free investing. Now, lobbyism is lobbyism. And as I said, from 1 to 10 billion, you need to have permission, right? And now uh, politicians get in the way and have an opinion on that. And that is fine. Uh, it's only representing a third of the revenue of Trade Republic anyway. But at the same time, I don't believe that this money will go away because this money stays in the system. And I believe due, due to that law, there's going to be a change in the power between the exchange, the uh, issuer like BlackRock, the uh, uh, broker and the consumer. And the good news is we're on your side and uh, we represent millions of people across Europe. And so we have a lot of, let's say, negotiating power uh, to get that money on the right side of it. Um, and we will see how this evolves, but obviously it's a very interesting thing to now be a voice in that conversation. I've been myself very, very times in, in Brussels uh, uh, last 12, 18 months to really insert the voice of you of retail investors into that conversation to, to get a great deal out of it. Yeah, you're doing a great job there. So um, payment order, one third of your revenues, we'll see how it goes. Where, how big is the opportunity you're asking, you're going for? You, I, mean, you're, I mean, savings is a huge part of, of, of consumer right. balance sheet, etc. So it's, it's growing more than GDP, basically. So growing market, 
very sticky model. If you have your savings with the company, you're right. you never switch. H how big is that opportunity? So coming back again to the first four years, right? It was not only hard to tell people that uh, I want to found a bank, but it was already hard to tell people, hey, I'm a German company, and I actually do believe people are going to trade stocks. Uh, it's always hard to believe when you come from the Nordics, but basically us Germans, we hate trading stocks, we hate risks, right? We have a very, very uh, tense relationship to it. And so actually, eight out of 10 people do not invest money. Um, but you see that through companies like Trade Republic, many first-time investors have now a different tendency and relationship towards investing. They actually start investing. Now, if you zoom out, and I think that's always the first slide in every pitch deck we're using since seven years, um, Europe has the second highest GDP per capita on the world, yet the lowest investment quota under developed industrialized nations globally. So the real, how much do you save of your income in equities? So only eight, eight out of 10 people are not investing, mm -hmm. right? And um, that's really a, a, a scary and frightening figure if you look into the pension system, right? I mean, the Nordics, people are blessed with uh, tax incentivized, state incentivized uh, private pension planning, the same as in the UK and, and America. But then if you go to continental Europe, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, there's no such things. There's no tax benefits, no repers, no nothing. So people are actually screwed because if they just rely on the government pension, they uh, are will not having sufficient pension uh, when they retire. And a company like Trade Republic is helping them to self-save. So to your question, I think it's a gigantic opportunity because you look into the GDP, you look into the low investment quota, and if that's going to be filled because people are actually trying to solve the pension gap, um, I think the numbers tell us it's one of the largest and fastest growing markets globally. And um, as you know, many incumbents in Europe have a hard time adapting to the future. So we actually believe with Trade Republic over the next 30 years, we can craft one of the most significant financial institutions there are uh, in Europe and empower millions of people uh, to really build a private pension. And how, on your product side, how are you thinking about that medium term? Like today trading on stocks, derivatives, ETFs, right. you can create your own portfolio, savings plan, bonds, deposits. You, you, you have 4% deposit right. you're offering, you're actually cutting nothing in between and you're giving everything away to ECB. Is that working for you? Yeah, so I think the, the, the ultimate promise we give you as a consumer that you get the best deal for your money. What does it mean? Like whenever you choose to invest, whenever you choose to make more out of your money, uh, Trade Republic gives you uh, uh, the easiest, fastest and cheapest way to invest. Um, so basically, when uh, the interest rate environment was turning and ECB decided to increase rates, we've been actually the, one of the first banks in Europe to pass through 2% interest rates to consumers without any restriction. So you can just hit the button and get 2%. We renewed that promise in September by now passing 4% to people. It's actually the highest interest rate across Europe right now. Um, and that obviously is a great promise. It creates viral growth and brings you many consumers, many assets. Um, now, if you zoom out, I think the bet and butter, butter product of Trade Republic is a savings plan. So you go to Trade Republic, you set up MSCI World, the world economy, and you deposit 100, maybe 200 euros a month, and you do it over and over time. And um, we basically created the category here. So that product was already live in Germany, but in the last three years, we doubled the market. We doubled the market. Today, Trade Republic has more than 50% market share in savings plans, meaning we have more ETF savings plans in Germany than all other incumbent banks combined, right? So that's a fast uh, trajectory. And we believe, um, especially when people start uh, very early in their life to save, that's one of the best relationships in the French industry, which you can have with a human. And we're very happy to help them to, to, to get more money. So the 4% attracts assets under management and then, and then you launch sort of investment, the savings products on top of that to, to, to monetize them. Yes, no, of course. I mean, um, I think people come because they see it's a great deal for the money. So they come, they bring the assets, and then we help them to make more out of the assets, to diversify, to invest in capital markets. We see that people who come after the interest rates trade uh, or invest uh, as good as people who came before. And it's really a long-term journey and, uh, and a, an important promise to make. Fantastic. We're running out of time, so we only have a couple of seconds left. But I mean, a lot to talk about. But I think the theme of, of Slush is building to last. I think that epitomizes is really about tr what the Trade Republic is about, because without building something that lasts, you're not going to attract the consumers 
money and savings at a high rate and uh, being there for the long term. What has been essential for you to build that sort of lasting um, enterprise? It was important for us to get a banking license because eventually I want to go to you, the consumer, and say I'm the right companion, I'm the right partner for the next 30 years of your financial life. So your money is safe and secure. So really the essence of building to last is really one of the core ingredients and pitches we bring to the people. And that hopefully, hopefully uh, empowers us to build one of the most yeah, significant savings platforms in Europe uh, in this generation. Fantastic, Christian. Thanks a lot for coming. You're going to be stay over the weekend, right? Yes, I'm going to explore Helsinki, maybe some sauna. It's going to be You're fun. You're going to do smoke sauna as well? Hopefully, yes. Hopefully. I'll, I'll see you. I'll, I'll maybe not see you because okay. it's smoky. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for joining. I appreciate your time. Thank you.